thank you so much, Gabrielle, for uh, setting this conference up. Um, today's, uh, or I guess this, this time will be dedicated to sharing just some photos, some thoughts um, about a trip that the, the church took this summer to Nigeria. Um, that it was a real privilege and a blessing for me to sort of participate in. Um, we have here on the screen Bishop Maximus and Father Stephen, uh, who, who are sort of the main people in this story of a story of prayer. Um, so with that in mind, I'd like to actually ask Father John if, if we could start off uh, the session with a prayer as well. O heavenly King, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, whatever present and fill us all things, a treasure of your good and bestower of life. Come and dwell in us and cleanse us from every stain and save our souls, O good one. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Uh, so uh, this is actually a photo that one of the last photos that I took um, when we were about to leave Nigeria in the capital in Abuja on our on our flight home. Uh, but the story in some ways, at least for me, began in upstate New York at the Holy Ascension Parish in Bearsville. Uh, this was sort of the meeting point for everybody that was going to accompany um, Bishop Maximus. This is where everybody assembled, so to speak. Um, so here you'll see Bishop Maximus, Father Parthenius, who is a higher monk from the Monastery of St. Gregory of Sinai in Kelseyville, California. Uh, to Bishop Maximus's left is Timothy Shinoni, uh, who accompanied uh, this, uh, this group uh, with the aim of capturing video footage and hopefully will uh, produce a wonderful documentary. Uh, Dimitri Fotopoulos and myself um, and, and the rest of everybody that you see in this picture are all the wonderful volunteers that helped us pack our bags. And when I say pack our bags, uh, <laughs> there, were, there were quite a lot, there was quite a lot of luggage. So uh, often, you know, when people ask me what I was doing in Nigeria, I like to say that I was just a bag carrier for his grace. Uh, I think we had between 14 to 15 suitcases uh, full of liturgical supplies, uh, vestments, icons, everything that you might need to set up a parish, to set up multiple parishes. Um, so uh, we we came prepared, or as prepared as we thought. Uh, I mean, as prepared as we could have been. This is um, after a long flight. This was my first glance, my first look um, at Nigeria, still out of the plane. So, and here we are having landed, and now the question became, how do we fit all the luggage and ourselves into the van that came to pick us up? So, uh, everybody, of course, always asked me, well, what did you eat? So I just wanted to let you know from the very beginning of this presentation that I will, of course, try to show some of the cuisine of the of the Nigerian of our Nigerian hosts, the Teve tribe, absolutely delicious. So here you can see some jollof rice and some fried plantains and some catfish. Um, so, anyways, back to Nigeria. Um, just to give everybody a quick overview in, of geography. So Nigeria is on the western, you know, coast of of Africa. Um, it's a rather large country. So to put it into perspective, Nigeria, you know, covers uh, many states, is the size of many of our east, you know, on the eastern seaboard. Nigeria is, in fact, larger than Texas. So some people like to use Texas, where everything's bigger in Texas as a reference point. But Nigeria is larger than Texas. And um, we, we were in a particular part of Nigeria, not on the coast, but rather more in the middle belt, in the interior, in a place called Benue State. Benue State is home of the Teve tribe. 
This is the tribe that had reached out to the church, asking that a bishop come, that missionaries come, and, and start and bring the Orthodox Church to the Teve people. Um, the Teve tribe is about 15 million, 14 to 15 million people, and uh, they're sort of headquartered out of the city of Gboku. Uh, Makurdi is the state capital, and Gboku is sort of the tribal capital, where, where the traditional ruler, their paramount king, uh, King James, has his palace. And here is a photograph of King James himself. Um, one of the first things that we did prior to conducting any services um, or, or, you know, holding any, any type of event, public event, uh, we, we stayed in our hotel until we had an audience with the main king. Uh, so this is King James, the, the Teve tribe um, has uh, systems of kings. Um, sort of a system of traditional rulers, and King James uh, is the paramount king, so he's a monarch of about 14 million people, and we had an audience with him. Uh, he was very gracious, very hospitable, um, and, and we expressed our, our desire to, you know, answer the call, so to speak, of of people of his tribe that had asked for the church to come and he listened to what the bishop had to say and you know warmly extended uh, his greetings and gave his blessings for us to preach in all of his lands uh, for which we were greatly uh, appreciative here here's another photo uh, this is sort of the throne room of of within the palace complex um, it, it was uh, an incredible experience. Here um, is also within the palace complex, uh, meeting with some of the local dignitaries. Um, you'll notice that uh, a lot of the, the Teve people are, are wearing black and white, uh, you know, clothes and, and a lot of the walls and the architecture will reflect this. So the, the totem animal, or the colors of the Teve tribe are black and white in honor of the zebra. Uh, so that again was uh, uh, something that you'll see throughout this presentation. Here, Bishop Maximus and our, our party is standing outside of the administration block of the palace complex. And once we had achieved or our, our goal of introducing ourselves to the traditional ruler, to the king, um, and, and receiving his blessing to, to perform our missionary activities, uh, we immediately you know, moved forward. And the next day, uh, we held our first cycle, so to speak, of, of you know, baptisms and, and liturgy. So here, uh, Bishop Maximus is reading the prayers before the baptism. Uh, as you can imagine, you know, I, I've gone to many baptisms growing up within the church, but it's typically one person. On occasion, it might be a family that's converting to the Orthodox faith, and there's, you know, a, a couple people. This was my first time of, of being present and witnessing literally tens if and sometimes over a hundred people getting baptized so it was uh, an incredible experience uh, this video is actually um, the baptism of father stephen himself so he is the person that originally reached out uh, to the church to our bishops in greece and then was has been in communications over the years with his eminence, Metropolitan Demetrius, and his grace, Bishop Maximus. Um, and he had organized everything that you will see, uh, all the communities that we visited, all of the people that had been catechized. Uh, this was all the work um, 
of, of Father Stephen, who was a lay person himself. So again, this is a very, truly an inspiring moment for me. The servant of God, Stephen, is baptized in the name of the Father. Amen. And of the Son. Amen. And of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 So here you'll see Bishop Maximus reading the prayers over the newly illumined servants of God. Uh, there was probably somewhere between 50 to 60 uh, people that got baptized this first day of our services. Um, we had the, the blessing of being able to use a school building um, within a larger campus, a local college in the city of Goboku, Malamin College. Uh, the, the director of the college, uh, Professor David, um, who, who is not part of the church, but is truly a, a benefactor of the Orthodox Church, Father Stephen had reached out to him and expressed that there was a bishop coming from America and that they needed space to perform um, all of their missionary work, and uh, Professor David was most gracious in, in allowing us to use this classroom. Uh, so at the far end, you can see we've sort of set up uh, the, the altar area. Um, here, you know, the, the baptismal service continues with chrismation and ablution. You might be wondering, okay, you did baptisms. What other sacraments of the church were performed during this missionary trip? And a question often comes up is people, I, I can say that I've always struggled to imagine what a missionary journey must be like. What does a missionary do? Well, it turns out the, a missionary will have to do whatever the bishop tells him needs to happen. And in this case, uh, roughly at nine o'clock at night before, you know, we were told by Bishop Maximus, um, we didn't bring any crowns to perform the wedding services, and we need to do weddings tomorrow. Figure it out. <laughs> so that is why you see uh, this, this bed converted into a lush jungle, and, and Dimitri, very talented young man, weaving wedding crowns um, in the middle of the night. But I, I think um, everybody would agree that for the little time and resources that we had on hand, uh, glory be to God, the, the, the wedding, um, the sacrament of, of matrimony was, was a, a beautiful sight indeed. So this is Father Stephen and his wife, as well as Father Andrew and, and um, Presbyter Abigail uh, getting married. Bishop Maximus with the two lovely brides. And then after the baptism, which was followed by the wedding, we served our first liturgy, and and here is, uh, you know, the communion at the end of liturgy. Uh, please note, uh, if you can actually see, I'll sort of enlarge. Uh, the the Tief people are a, a hierarchical society; they're a hierarchical culture, 
and they truly appreciate value, sort of their monarchy and their system of kings, and thus they understand the idea or a concept of a throne. So when they were told that, you know, the bishop is coming and it, the bishop needs a throne, um, they, they weren't flustered at all. Um, and they provided this wonderful uh, throne for Bishop Maximus. Um, so here's another photo. Here's a picture um, of us after that liturgy. Um, you'll note that there are two federal police officers. Um, one of the things that King James granted at the request of Bishop Maximus was some security. And we were assigned uh, two police officers for escorts. Unfortunately, um, Nigeria has a lot of issues with insecurity. Um, so we were very grateful that uh, the king granted our request and uh, officer in Inspector Luna um, and, and his colleague accompanied us throughout, throughout our journeys across Nigeria. Here are some of the newly illumined and very joyous parishioners. This is Grace. Um, anyways, the, the next weekend, um, you know, actually not the next weekend, the next day. So the first baptisms took place on a Saturday. And on Sunday, we, we had a hierarchical liturgy um, with, with Father, Stephen, Father Stephen being ordained to the diaconate. And here he is with his family, extended family, his uh, older brothers, his mother, his uh, presbytera with their newly born, um, nieces and nephews. Uh, we were really blessed um, by everybody that um, you know we encountered was so hospitable. Um, in general, the Nigerian people, the Tiv tribe in particular, are are one of the most hospitable group of people I've ever met in my life. And um, blessing in Abraham. This is a blessing. And uh, Abraham, the older brother of Father Stephen, were true exemplars of the hospitality, love of, of the Teve people. Um, Blessing took it upon herself for the duration of our time there to, to make sure that we were always well fed with her, with her delicious cooking and any other of our needs were met. So we all um, really felt like we had an adopted, we were adopted by this family. Uh, so I miss them. I miss them dearly. Uh, here is an example. B Bishop Maximus encouraged myself, Timothy, and Dimitri at every opportunity that we had, as we would go to different parishes, different communities, to always, um, f you know, ask for the local newly baptized. Um, members of the church to participate in the services and for us to try to pass down and teach them um, the little that we know, uh, you know, in terms of how to serve a hierarchical liturgy or just how to serve in the altar um, uh, to where, you know, they can start taking ownership of serving the church, serving their parishes. So here are, again, uh, two of the leaders within the, the church. Uh, we, in addition to staying in Boku, which was sort of the headquarters, we would often um, go out into other villages by car. Um, and this is just an example of your typical, uh, you know, building in, in the village. So they still um, will often make huts from their own homemade, you know, mud bricks and thatch roofs. Um, if a particular family uh, is, you know, well off or, or, you know, a higher standard of living, they may have uh, sort of 
central structure um, where, where, the, where the family may meet or the patriarch of the family may reside. And then around, around him, the other families, his children, his, his wife, um, in some cases, wives uh, within Nigeria, the practice of polygamy is still, is, is still found. Um, you know, over the past hundred years with the different Christian missionaries, um, it has really greatly been reduced, uh, but that uh, is something that it was culturally acceptable for, for you know, many, many years. Um, here it, we uh, have arrived at um, one of the villages where the parish of St. Isaac the Syrian uh, has been waiting for years, literally, for the arrival of the bishop, and, and I'm so grateful to have been able to capture this and, and share it with you. singing the refrain is is blessed is he that cometh in the name of the lord um this is uh, father stephen in addition to preaching the gospel and and catechizing his tribe he also has translated the liturgy vespers matins hymns we were there in august so we were there for the dormition and and they had the appropriate hymns of the dormition translated and set to Tiv, you know, in the Tiv language and into more uh, tribal uh, arrangements, you know, African arrangements. Um, so, uh, and, and Bishop Maximus, uh, to any of the students here, I'm just saying perhaps the next time that we are graced uh, with a visit uh, to Etna by Bishop Maximus, this is an example of the joy and the enthusiasm that we should be meeting him with. So just putting that out there. Uh, and that and to anybody else sort of on, on, uh, online, if, you know, the Metropolitan is coming to your parish soon, you know, this is an example. So here at the parish of St. Isaac the Syrian, uh, we, we had, you know, again, uh, many people had, that had been waiting for, for this day to come. Um, and uh, we uh, first conducted the service of baptisms once we set up sort of the mobile uh, church. So everywhere we would go, we would have to bring our suitcases, set everything up uh, as best as we could, um, and then start with the service of baptism.
It was truly moving to see just how eager, with such anticipation, they had been waiting and how eager they were to become members of, of the church. Uh, this uh, gentleman here, uh, when he came out of the font, I'll, I'll never forget his just, just joy saying, Hallelujah! 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 <laughs> you know? Uh, wow. And here you can see the joy on Bishop Maximus's face as he's presented with his first chicken. Uh, so as, as a token of love, of appreciation, you know, in, in the different communities that we went to, oftentimes the villagers would bring their offering uh, to, to the bishop. So here, uh, I don't think his grace was expecting this. Uh, but he was very, very much appreciative. Um, and here we are, you see um, one of the local kings. Um, so this is a lower level king. There's sort of, I guess, six to seven, I get tiers of kings. Um, and this is the lowest level of that local village um, and his uh, council of elders with him uh, greeting uh, Bishop Maximus, after the services, they were in attendance for the baptisms and the liturgy. Um, and here are some small tokens of our appreciation, some gifts. Uh, these are actually candles uh, made by the Holy Ascension Parish in, in Bearsville, New York, by their candle shop. So if, you, if you've never um, seen or looked into purchasing some candles there, you definitely should they were a big hit all over Nigeria, and I'm sure you'll love them too. Uh, here are some of the parishioners. So speaking of kings, um, when we were back in Boku, which is again sort of the central uh, town, the central city for the Tiv tribe, um, we uh, had a meeting with King David lord of Jembalan. Uh, he has, I would say, between four to five million people under his, uh, uh, under his sort of um, reign, uh, or, and, and he's also responsible for a geographical area. Um, uh, so, so, you know, he is the lord of the, of, of Gboku, of Buruku, of, and other parts of, of the areas where we were doing missionary activity. Uh, so we, of course, also met with him, uh, and he also warmly received us, and he's proven to be uh, also a, a true benefactor of the church. Here we are um, at the parish of uh, St. Cosmos and Damien in Mignon, uh, which is a little bit outside of Gboku. And um, one of the main goals, in addition to actually visiting all the different communities that Father Stephen had, had you know, organized, uh, was also to find property within Gboku itself, within Gboku proper, to have the missionary headquarters of, of the Nigerian church. Uh, so uh, what, what we did was we actually had a prayer service and read a paraclesis to St. Xenia of Petersburg. Uh, so here, this is what's going on here, uh, with asking for St. Xenia's help. And of course, there were the local tribal rulers, the kings in attendance, and of course, you can see Bishop Maximus had a throne. Um, Of some of the parishioners. Um, here, Father Stephen is, is showing us around the village. Uh, this photo I put into the slideshow to, I guess, try to share um, some of the less glamorous um, parts of a missionary journey. Uh, I imagine that you know, there, there are many different examples or, uh, that you could draw on, but oftentimes 
there would be these long periods of not knowing what's going on, no activity, waiting, and then it would be this rush of activity, it'd be really, really intense, and then it would again, you know, you would just not know, you know, what's next, and you would just have to sit patiently and wait. Um, because we were allowed to use a classroom at the college, uh, one of our responsibilities, those that came to assist Bishop Maximus, was to set up uh, the, the churches and then take them down, you know, because this, this facility, this space was actually being used during the week when we weren't there. Uh, so this was one evening where, where we came because we had liturgy the next morning and we came and set everything up ahead of time. And this was just a moment of peace, uh, uh, of, of waiting to be picked up. But uh, it, just thought I'd share that. Um, so the next morning, more baptisms. Um, for There were about 10 different parish communities that, that Father Stephen had founded. Um, we weren't able to visit them all. For, so for some of them, the parishioners actually came into Boku to be baptized, to participate in the liturgy. Uh, there just wasn't enough time. Um, we, uh, we really, uh, I, th I think here in America, don't appreciate just how good our uh, transportation systems are, our network of roads to where you can plan on going somewhere and get in the car and drive there, and, and it's easy to estimate how long it'll take. And, um, you know, that, that's not necessarily always true. <clears throat> In, in the area of Nigeria where we were, and therefore um, we weren't able to visit all 10 of, of the communities. So Father Stephen had organized for the different members and parishioners to come at, to Boku. So we had multiple sets of baptisms uh, at, at this particular location. <laughs> So, uh, yes, uh, you know, uh, and after, after um, the baptisms, we had another liturgy. Father Andrew was ordained to the diaconate as well. And... Uh, this picture actually is from another liturgy uh, the, next, the next day on Sunday. Um, we had another hierarchical service, and this was the occasion of the ordination of Father Stephen Tema to the priesthood. And we were honored, Father Stephen was honored, the church was honored by having uh, King David himself in attendance. Um, you will note uh, here... You can see uh, there's uh, the gentleman standing next to him has a set of beads, and it's just one set of beads. While uh, King David, if we'll see maybe later, or here I'll zoom in, he has multiple sets of beads, and that's their way of uh, distinguishing sort of the rank of the king. So King David is one level below the paramount king, the Torti of King James. Um, so he's one of the six kings on the next level. So this was truly a, a, an honor um, and a, a sign of support just from the tribe itself for our activities, um, you know, in, in, their, in, their, in their nation. Here, Father Stephen, uh, during his ordination, uh, the liturgy, Bishop Maximus uh, preaching. Uh, so Bishop Maximus, of course, would, would preach and, and homilize, uh, give his sermon in English. And a, a, lot of the, a lot of the Nigerian people, so English is the common language uh, spoken. It's the language of the marketplace throughout all of Nigeria. There's over 200 distinct tribes um, and over 
well over 200 different languages spoken in Nigeria. The Tiv tribe is unique is that they have a homogeneous language. So they, all the, Tiv, all the members of the Tiv nation, all the members of the Tiv tribe speak the same language. Other tribes, it might be the same tribe, but they'll have different dialects. Um, so again, you know, with about 14 million people in the Tiv tribe, I believe it's the fourth or fifth largest tribe in Nigeria and is roughly about 5% of the, of the Nigerian population. They also sort of extend into Cameroon, which is one of the neighboring countries, and there's also Tiv in the diaspora. Um, so Bishop Maximus would preach in English, and then Father Stephen would oftentimes translate very enthusiastically into Tiv. Um, and uh, it was truly, even though I didn't necessarily understand everything that he was saying, I could understand his love and his enthusiasm for the church. And obviously, you know, his, his people, uh, you know, could, could feel that as well. Uh, here's uh, Father, Father Stephen, his Matushka, his Brisbitea Arsini. And this is Professor David, the, the, the founder and or the director of Malamin College in Gboku, a wonderful school, um, and, uh, and King David. This was a truly uh, a moment that I, I don't think, I, I probably still don't understand just how much it meant to Father Stephen with his journey. So his journey to orthodoxy, his journey to this particular moment started over 10 years ago when he was a, a, a young child still in primary school and grade school. Um, he, he would have visions in the middle of the day. He would be sitting in class and unlike myself who would be daydreaming, uh, he would actually had uh, on a couple of occasions visions of, of priests with beards. Okay, so priests, people in liturgical garments with, with beards. That doesn't sound strange to me, having been born into the Orthodox Church, having been, uh, you know, raised within the church. Uh, but for Father Stephen in, in Africa, in Nigeria, um, growing up in a Catholic family, all of the Catholic priests are clean shaven. There are no priests with beards in Nigeria. There are no priests with beards in Benue State, in Gboku, in, in Buruku, in his village. He had never seen anything like that. Uh, and, you know, some of the Protestant pastors might have beards, but they don't wear liturgical garbs. And this was clearly not what he had, these visions that he had while, you know, awake in the middle of the day. And they always stuck with him. So, uh, you know, Years go on, he graduates from high school and uh, is, is employed at a local cement factory where he was the assistant to the plant director. And one of his duties was to translate from English into Tiv, all the instructions uh, for the workers. So he had access to the computer. And one fine day, he decides, well, what do I have to lose? I will Google priests with beards. And that is how Father Stephen first learned about the Orthodox Church. This was just the first step of many, many steps. And unfortunately, I don't have time to tell the whole story um, right now. Uh, but again, you know, this was a 10-year journey. And uh, once he finally made contact with, uh, you know, the genuine Orthodox Church of Greece, um, and, and reached out to Archbishop Kalinikos and uh, was received that email from Metropolitan Demetrius saying, you know, uh, hello, my name is Metropolitan Demetrius. I have been assigned by uh, his beatitude, the responsibility for Nigeria. It still took three more years of waiting for, for somebody to finally come, for somebody to finally make it. Uh, so, uh, the, the amount of patience and faith that Father Stephen had was finally realized in, in this moment. 
here. Um, so King David. God bless you. And God bless the other, the other king's traditional rulers. Uh, came uh, after the end of liturgy for a blessing from his grace. And in general, um, you know, the, the, the Tiv people were so grateful for the effort that um, the church, Bishop Maximus in particular, had, you know, for all these years been trying to come to Nigeria at their request. And here they honored him with dressing him in their traditional colors. Um, and granting him a spear. So uh, here Bishop Maximus is, is with some of the local kings. Uh, here we have uh, at the reception, and trust me, the Tiv people love receptions, they love speeches, they love any type of ceremony. Um, and of course, uh, we had to have MCs, and then there were the random people strolling around uh, with, um, uh, you know, armament. I, I, I'm assuming that this was security, but you never really knew. Um, here, uh, in addition to organizing parishes, Father Stephen truly is, is incredible, and he has organized um, the, the, well, in this case, this is a example of his efforts in organizing Goyan, the Genuine Orthodox Youth Association of Nigeria, and every parish uh, should have a chapter of Goyan, and they have their cultural dance ensemble, they'll have their youth choirs, and so on and so forth, because if you're having visitors, or esteemed guests, or a king, or whatnot, and you need to greet him properly, um, so of course we had the the real privilege of watching the, the reception, watching this ensemble perform their traditional dances. So this is the, the Goyan group from St. Mary of Egypt Parish in Sankara. Um, hopefully, Timothy and uh, Shinoni will one day soon release uh, his documentary, and I'm sure that there'll be much better footage of what we were able to uh, see and witness, but I just thought I'd share a, a quick a clip of that. Um, here, Father Stephen himself was also honored um, in being dressed in sort of the cultural colors and uh, the tribal colors of the Tiv people by the local kings. Uh, as I was saying, Timothy's working on making a documentary, and of course, everybody was very, very interested in what he was doing. Um, we uh, had a wonderful reception at one point in the trip from Professor David, uh, and he organized uh, all of the faculty, all of the administrators of his college uh, to, to be in attendance for this delicious banquet. Um, again, as promised, people were wondering what we were eating. So in this case, this was some, uh, again, jollop rice, fried rice, uh, some coleslaw. This was a delicious chicken. Uh, the food is wonderful. The hospitality is wonderful. Uh, we, I think, in America could really learn from sort of the genuineness. We could, there's a lot that we could learn um, but one of the things that we could definitely learn is just how, how they're ready to give everything, and especially for their guests. Um, so uh, here, um, Pro Professor David, uh, we were trying to think of what, what could we bring as you know, tokens of appreciation, and of you know, Bishop Maximus having uh, spent many, many years at the monastery in upstate New York, you know, maple syrup is something that we take for granted and is a, a favorite, uh, but we thought that perhaps uh, that would be something that isn't easily found 
in, in Nigeria. So in some of those suitcases, we logged along these uh, flasks of maple syrup as gifts. Uh, here, here we have uh, a photo of his grace and Professor David and uh, sort of his top advisors from the college. Uh, one of the things that they were advising us about was their concern, as some of the other local kings had expressed, their concern about our plans to visit a couple parishes and a couple communities in a region called Sankara. Unfortunately, uh, there's a lot of unrest and insecurity throughout all of Nigeria, and Benue State is, is not exempt from that. Um, particularly, this region of Sankara had had a basically a civil war going on for the past two years and the past six months or so it had really started to calm down but there was still a lot of banditry going on and there was concern that as foreigners as you know uh, a, a delegation from america that we could be a potential target for kidnapping or worse um, actually a couple uh, a, a week or so before we arrived there was a, a party of some Chinese mining engineers that had been abducted. One of them was killed. The rest were still missing while we were there. Um, so Professor David, King David, they all expressed concern that we were uh, hoping to go visit these parishes that had been waiting for His Grace to come for all these years. Uh, but <laughs> Father Stephen expressed that instead of taking the bridge across the river, Katsinala, we would, where the bandits, you know, are known to have an informer that keeps track of who's going and coming, we would get up early in the morning and take the ferry, and they would never expect that. Okay, you know, we were asking Father Stephen, well, what about, what's this ferry like? You know, is there a timetable? He was a little bit confused, to be honest, with the question of a timetable. He said, well, we'll just, the ferry will be there, the ferry will be there. Well, when we pull up to the river, we realize what the ferry is. And um, it's one of those autom automotive, like an auto ferry, where you can drive your car right onto the ferry and um, it takes you across the river. So that was uh, definitely an experience that I won't, won't forget. Here, uh, this is sort of our, our, the ferry captain taking us across the river. Uh, we had expressed interest if we were going to see any wild, you know, some of the safari, typical safari animals, giraffes, zebras, elephants, uh, hippos. When I heard that we're coming to a river, I said, oh, are we going to see hippos? And Father Stevens said, oh, no, don't worry, don't worry. They'll be scared off by the motor. So um, we had this motor to protect us um, from the hippos. They're actually quite dangerous animals. So we're actually very grateful to God that we didn't encounter any hippos um, because as it was, the boat, the ferry, you know, seemed to be uh, designed just enough to, to ferry across a car. Here's another example. And once we got across the river, we were in Sankara, and Father Stephen, with our protection in mind, had arranged for uh, some military escorts. In addition to the police, uh, we were grateful for, for the military escorts. Um, here we have arrived at the parish of St. Mary of Egypt. Um, you can see they're rushing with the throne. Um, for the bishop across the field, and and the parishioners again are greeting the bishop.
here we again begin with baptisms. In this case, the parish had been granted um, the permission to use an abandoned schoolhouse that unfortunately was closed down due to the Civil War, due to the banditry, um, but the owners and the local tribal elders, rulers, uh, allowed for the community of Orthodox Christians uh, to use that as a meeting place. And in their anticipation for the arrival of the bishop, they actually dug out and built this um, baptistry. Uh, so within, within Nigeria, the Catholic Church uh, does not baptize with immersion. Um, so, so, you know, this was a very symbolic thing that they were going to be baptized and they, in preparation for that, built this baptistry. Um, here you can see all the people gathered. There was a, 148 people baptized uh, this day at St. Mary's. And this community was founded, you know, through, through the proselytizing, through the evangelism of, of Father Stephen. Uh, and it started with just one person that finally sort of started listening to what Father Stephen had to say. And it went from one person to two people, to three people, to ten people. By the time that we got there, there was 148 people that were ready and catechized. Um, you know, so Father Stephen had been waiting for three years, but he wasn't sitting idly and, and upset that the bishops weren't coming. He, he kept working and kept preaching and kept teaching. And in fact, there were many more people in attendance than were baptized. And in fact, some people had expressed the desire to be baptized. But Father Stephen, you know, as a shepherd, knows his flock and said, well, hold on, I don't know you. You're not part of the church yet. If you want to become part of the church, you need to start coming and you need to be catechized and, um, you know, you can be baptized later. Here's after the, the baptism, waiting to be chrismated. The baptismal services were sort of done, for lack of a better word, in assembly line style, to where there were stations. You know, that was the only way to to have it done in an organized and orderly fashion. Um, oftentimes, Bishop Maximus, you know, after reading the prayers of exorcism, and um, uh, you know, Bishop Maximus would anoint everyone with the oil of gladness. Then they would go to to be baptized, and Father Parthenius or Father Stephen or Father Andrew would be baptizing. Then they would go and change and get in line to be chrismated, then go into another line for ablution, and then a third line for tonsuring. Um, so, so it was, you know, again a, a wonderful experience just to see so many people become parts of the church. At a, at a same time. Another thing that really made an impression on me, um, you know, part of the baptismal service is the dance of Isaiah. And I always wondered, why is it referred to as the dance of Isaiah? No, no I mean, they, it's just the priest and he like takes the sponsors and the little infant and goes around the baptismal font three times and that's it. There's no real dancing. Well, I've never been to a baptism where there was 
over a hundred people getting baptized. And all hundred of them had to go around the baptismal font three times while singing, as many as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. After, after the baptism was done, we immediately proceeded on with the liturgy. And after liturgy, of course, uh, Bishop Maximus had a sermon. And in this case, it was very moving that all the local kings that were in attendance came up uh, immediately after the sermon with a request to, to speak. And, and their request to His Grace was that He say a prayer for, for the land, and He say a prayer for peace. That there be peace in, in the land. And afterwards, His Grace blessed everybody you know, the kings with icons of the Mother of God and Christ, and, of course, some maple syrup. And candles from the Holy Ascension Parish in Bearsville, New York, from the candle shop that you should also uh, look into. And, uh, you know, what I realized was going to become uh, uh, sort of a reoccurring event, the the Kings again honored um, Bishop Maximus uh, by adorning him and with with the tribal garments um, and giving him a spear. So here's uh, some of the local, the police officers and some of the military. Here they are actually going around the school, evaluating it um, as a potential, you know, perhaps one day um, the parish will be able to purchase outright this whole facility. It's a quite a large uh, place uh, that there could be, you know, a, a school, a, a parochial school, a small farm in addition to a church and a parish hall. Here is our uh, one of our fearless he looks like one of those correspondents uh, he's sharing his insights and it looks like Timothy is uh, make doing a selfie documentary and here we are heading back so again this was truly a, a, a memorable day for all of us at St. Mary of Egypt you know the next weekend we had a, another hierarchical liturgy, and Father Andrew was ordained to the priesthood. Again, there were many of the newly illumined faithful, both from Gboku as well as some of the surrounding areas that came. 
Father Andrew with his presbytera, Abigail. This is the sisterhood in all of their colorful dresses, uh, getting the food. And, of course, this is the uh, Goyan uh, Dance Ensemble of St. Isaac the Syrian. And in this particular case, I don't know if you can see uh -huh, this very serious young man drumming. Uh, here's the picture. Uh, sort of the leader of the dance ensemble, she did the entire dance with this jar on her head. And at the end, she very demonstratively, you know, threw it off to prove to everybody that it wasn't attached in any way uh, throughout the dance, that she, in fact, was balancing it. It was quite impressive. Um, I have not tried to do this at home uh, because I, I don't think I would have any of her skills, but nevertheless, I was impressed. Oh. This is another example of just uh, a re you know, where we would go, where there were parishes. This is also, again, in Sankara, uh, deep in the bush. Um, in this case, we actually arrived in Sankara, crossing the river, drove, 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 and the military escort wasn't showing up, so we actually had to pull over by a local police station and wait. And um, in this part of, of Benway State, it was actually illegal. They, they made it illegal to drive on motorbikes because the bandits arrive wearing masks on motorbikes with guns, and so they've just made motorbikes illegal. So you can imagine <clears throat> what all of our thoughts were when, when we see these group of young men on motorbikes arriving. But glory be to God, it turned out that these were our military escorts. Um, so, but uh, this is the parish of St. Cyril and Methodius in Sankara. Um, there was no building suitable to to have an altar or to make a church so they actually were able to find a tent and we made the tent sort of into this tabernacle you know a, a tent an altar um, and after the baptisms again this is a parish we have a parish of over 50 orthodox christian in a village that doesn't have running water doesn't have electricity but they have the church it, I, you know, it really makes you stop and think. Here, Bishop Maximus is tonsuring. Um, this was actually something that, that um, we needed to explain, that the bishop and Father Stephen and Father Andrew had to explain to the people because some of them had reservations. Uh, unfortunately, black magic and witchcraft is still prevalent in, in Nigeria, in Benue State, and oftentimes people that practice uh, witchcraft or, or the occult will, will you know, use hair as a way. Uh, anyway, so there was so, some hesitation from the people to, to, to be tonsured, and it had to be explained that before this was corrupted and perverted um, by those that serve, you know, s Satan, 
this was actually first a way to dedicate yourself, a symbol of a dedication to God. Um, so after that was explained, there, there was no more hesitation. I, I could spend probably a whole day talking about all the pictures, all the people that we met, um, but for the essence of time, I'm sort of having to go through these. Uh, again, you know, the theme of, of Bishop Maximus getting a spear continues. In this case, um, it was again, uh, you, if you if you try to understand some of the things we don't, I don't think really under, uh, doesn't make sense to us how a place where there isn't running water or there isn't electricity, there people are living in, in mud huts with thatch roofs, have a throne, you know, an appropriate chair for a bishop, or in their typical case, a king to sit on. But that's because they're a hierarchical and, and a, a deeply traditional culture. And, and they honored uh, his grace by making sure that there was an appropriate place for him to sit. And in this case, also another chicken. Uh, they brought peanuts. This is yam, actually Sankara. Uh, there's a city in, Zaki, in Sankara, Zakibyam, which is the, has the world's largest outdoor yam market. So when you think of yams, it's not what you find in Whole Foods. It's these massive, uh, hairy, I don't know, lack of a better word, hairy things. Uh, which are cooked in, I don't know, 10, 15 different ways. Uh, it's really a staple. Here, Father Stephen is explaining to His Grace um, the land that the local king had given as a gift to the church. And basically, it was from that tree to that tree to, to that tree and to, you know, to this rock um, is, is how it was explained. And uh, God willing, there will one day stand an Orthodox temple, an Orthodox church. Uh, in addition to the military escorts, on our way back through Sankara, we actually had some of the, uh, the youths uh, from the St. Mary Parish uh, meet us there and then accompany us back, uh, you know, on this pickup truck, and they were singing hymns. And, 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 you know, very, very joyful the entire way. So I, you know, thought that we had both sort of the worldly security and, in a sense, some spiritual security as well. So I don't know if Bishop Maximus would want our seminarians to greet him this particular way next time he comes to Aetna, but, you know, we'll ask Bishop Oxensia to see what he says. Uh, here is a picture, again, blessing um, with, with Timothy, Father Parthenius, and, and Dimitri before they leave, left. Uh, we were all supposed to leave three weeks in. There was so much work that Bishop Maximus uh, decided to extend his trip, and uh, I was asked to stay with him. Uh, but Father Parthenius, uh, Timothy, and Dimitri had other uh, prior commitments that they had to attend to, so they kept to the normal schedule and uh, left earlier. Um, again, Blessing was sort of the main, main chef. Uh, here we are on the day that they left. Police is your friend. Help your friend to serve you better. Give information of criminals, criminals, hideouts, and su suspected person to police, please. This is, uh, again, in another part of Sankara that we went to. Uh, we, of course, stopped by the police station to let them know that we were going to be there and that we we're going into the bush. Um, uh, you know, they, they explained that they're keeping it very low key. We don't want to uh, let the bandits know that, that anything out of the ordinary is happening. Nobody knows. Nobody knows, right? Uh, <clears throat> and yet, when we come to the, the junction to come off the main road and head off into the bush, 
<laughs> we see this large poster of announcing the arrival of His Grace Bishop Maximus of Pelagonia. So, you know, this is an example of sort of the, when I say the bush, it was sort of through parts, you were the, it was brushing up against the car, but we had, um, you know, again, military escorts uh, uh, in front of us, uh, a, a vanguard and a rear guard. Um, And uh, yeah, it was pretty shaky. Uh, the roads were not the best. Once we got close, of course, the, the villagers met us and helped push the car and, and greeted His Grace with, with branches. This is the parish of St. Joseph of Arimathea. Here, they're waiting. And this is after baptism being chrismated. A sermon. This is Seraphim, one of our, he, he accompanied us on all of our journeys and sort of became the head server during my time there. Very bright young man. Uh, here, after um, the, the baptism, and uh, there was, of course, a reception where speeches were given. And uh, Bishop Maximus, of course, was honored with uh, another spear, and in this case, they gifted a goat. Uh, so I had the joy of having the goat right in front of me all the way home uh, in the car on the ride on the ride back. And now that goat is sort of the first, uh, you know, it's uh, part of the church's flock of goats. So they're sort of an agricultural ministry. Here are some of the local villagers that also helped provide security. Their trip back. This was the final baptism that we did when, when we were there. But as you'll see, Father Stephen and, and the, the church is continuing to grow. So they have continued to perform baptisms. Um, after after we had left. This is uh, Abraham, a seraphim. There were times for, for downtime. Um, this is a, a picture of land uh, that was actually owned by King David that we found that was suitable in, it's inside of Goboku in a very safe area and right off of a main road that's paved, um, but nevertheless quiet and peaceful. Uh, here, Father Stephen um, is, is sharing how, you know, God willing, there'll be uh, a, a deanery, an office for the deanery and a formation house and, and a cathedral. And he, I asked him, you know, how many people do you think there would be on a regular Sunday? And he said, God willing, uh, there will easily be 400. And I believe it. So this is when we first came to look at the land. Um, and glory be to God, we were able to purchase the land while we were still there. And we decided that we needed to have a procession. So here, <laughs> this is a weld, a weld shop. And we're welding a, a, a pole for the cross. And just from my own engineering background and, and all the weld shops, I had never seen exactly this type of welding machine, just a transformer. But it, was, it worked. And uh, here, 
Here, Abraham is with the cross now in preparation. We made banners. And on the Feast of the Dormition, uh, we were able to actually process from the college uh, about three kilometers uh, to, to the land that was purchased. buyers that just start dancing and that's just a way that they express their joy um, so uh, along all the entire you know path of the procession all the passer buyers were just overjoyed to see this procession I had grown up you know always with our parish priest uh, organizing processions, you know, for Pascha, and that the lantern goes first, and then the cross, and then the and then the banners, and then the choir, and then the clergy and the lady. Well, uh, I had, uh, you know, never in my life did I think that I would be able to help organize a procession where there was the, you know, the candle, the cross, the banner, the choir, and then the drum section followed by the spear bearers, you know, accompanying the bishop with the dikiri and tirikiri. So, uh, you know, anyways. Wow is right. And here we are at the land. Where there was a service of blessing of the water, and then the, and then the bishop processed around the land, blessing it with holy water. So, and this was sort of the final act of, of our missionary journey um, while we were in Nigeria. This is back in Abuja at the airport, um, you know, and there's a lot of things that you see uh, that are not the ordinary when you travel abroad. And in this case, the Lufthansa pilot cleaning off his own windshield um, before we took off. So I took a picture of that as well. Anyways, um, so in some sense, our journey uh, and, you know, came to an end. But since then, the church has continued to grow and, and continued uh, to build on the foundation that Father Stephen all these years had been working on and then was sort of uh, fulfilled with the arrival of his grace, Bishop Maximus. And, you know, at now with us leaving, you know, Father Stephen didn't have access to the large college room. Um, but so he was able to start serving in, in various locations and uh, visit the other parishes. And not a moment was lost in terms of actually building. So we, we purchased the land, and through the generosity of many people um, from, from America that have supported both the, you know, to cover the expenses of, of the bishop to, to travel there and, and bring all the supplies and whatnot, uh, but we were also able to help support financially with the building project. So here, um, you can see the parishioners, in addition to the youth organization, every parish has a chapter of Goyan, which is the genuine Goman, the genuine Orthodox Men's Association of Nigeria, uh, where the local parishioners 
you know, will share, you know, if they have a particular trade or a skill, and then they organize these workforces and to build, to build churches to accomplish projects for the church. And here they're making their own bricks. Um, so this was a priority. We, of course, brought a lot of sacred vessels, uh, you know, vestments, liturgical items, and there really wasn't a place where they could be stored securely. Um, there needed to be a, really a missionary headquarters. So one of the buildings that uh, is, is being worked on is the deanery headquarters. So the missionary headquarters of the Church of Nigeria, which includes the deanery office, a cell for Bishop Maximus when he comes back, and they are all waiting for Bishop Maximus uh, to come back as soon as possible and stay. They all, of course, want Bishop Maximus to just stay there. Um, but at the very least, a uh, cell for him when he comes back to visit. Um, here are examples of, of the construction projects. Here you can see they finished, you know, they, after the blocks were done, they built out the structure, started working on the roof. Um, here's uh, the deanery house roof is actually complete last i spoke earlier this week with father stephen and he he shared with me these pictures and then the next project that they're working on right now is uh the parish hall and temporary church um so this will be the church building until until they can build the actual main church um at which point they'll become a parish hall and a you know a church school um, so right now they have about half of the roof uh, completed. Here, uh, Father Stephen is uh, being presented with a certificate of occupancy from King David for, for the deanery house and, and just the, the land in general. And, you know, God willing, one day there will be a beautiful Orthodox church a traditional basilica-like structure, uh, because one of the things that Bishop Maximus worked on uh, was uh, to help draw plans for for the future church. And here, this is a proud of it. We're going to be very proud of the headquarters. From the east, from the north side, the west, people will come here. So I was talking to this grace and said, "Look, whatever it is, no matter the site, we should make it look like an Orthodox church." We will make a difference from the um, uh, the Roman Catholic uh, structures. And I believe it by the idea because he just said he is getting a kind of semi, um, it's a kind of uh, doing. It's going to be attractive. The building, if it is clean, is a part of holiness. So uh, another another project that they're working on. Um, is in the town village of Buruku, the parish of St. Anthony. Um, they were able to acquire this particular uh, building, this plot of land, and that had a building uh, that was suitable for their needs, but in pretty poor condition. And they've since sort of uh, done some uh, repairs and have set up the parish of St. Anthony's. And in, in addition to the parish, there's a little parish school that they've started. Um, there are many, many very talented people uh, and, and, and within the church. This is actually Christopher, who is a budding iconographer. Um, here is an icon that he sort of sketched out of St. Macarius. And uh, this leads me associated with the um, Church of St. Anthony is actually also the St. Macarius Formation House. Um, and these are two of the students, uh, Linus and Shedrach, as well as their wives, um, that are currently enrolled in the Formation House program. 
uh, Father Stephen, with the blessing of his eminence, Metropolitan Demetrius, and uh, his, the blessing and support of his grace, Bishop Maximus, has already organized a formation house for the future clergy of, of Nigeria uh, that would help prepare them uh, to where they would be able to come and study at St. Fortius Orthodox Theological Seminary. So uh, Father Patapius, the Dean of the Seminary, uh, Bishop Maximus, as well as uh, Father John uh, Summers, who is the headmaster uh, and director of the St. Uh, John of Damascus Orthodox Initiative, are all collaborating in, in preparing curriculum and uh, helping Father Stephen in this really uh, incredible work. So that, that brings me to the end of the presentation, but I've been asked by a, a lot of people uh, ways that people can support the church in Nigeria. And I, first and foremost, I would ask everybody to keep Father Stephen and his entire flock in, in their prayers, in their private prayers, but also to ask your priest at your parish to commemorate Father Stephen at the Divine Liturgy, to commemorate Father Stephen and the Nigerian Church at the Proscomedia. This is very, very important because first and foremost, uh, you know, this work is truly a spiritual effort. And, and Father Stephen is constantly asking for our prayers and is constantly praying for us as well as everybody in Nigeria keeps the church in America in their prayers of thanksgiving. Another way that you can help is to donate supplies, whether it be vestments, books, liturgical supplies, candles, icons, particularly if you have paper icons that you don't know what to do with. Say you have you know, old calendars from the past 20 years piling up and you know you don't want to throw them away in the trash because they have these beautiful icons on them well what you can do is you can cut out the icon and laminate it and then send it to the holy ascension parish in bearsville and this is a really powerful way to support any missionary whether it be in nigeria or the missionary communities in haiti in colombia in cuba mexico city guatemala because what Bishop Maximus will do is when they bring the icons, um, they don't just hand them out to people, okay? Each parish will be given some icons and then they will sell them sort of in their little parish kiosk at a price point, which makes sense for that local community. Um, but this way, the parishioners, first of all, can support financially their own parish by purchasing an icon. And this also helps, you know, if you pay for something, oftentimes you're, you value it more. Um, so this has been a, a very practical way to both help the local communities support themselves, as well as to, you know, support them uh, with uh, materials that they would have a hard time getting. Um, so if you have, all you know a box full of old paper icons or again old calendars or whatnot now you have an idea of what you can do with them again a huge thank you to all the parishes uh saint markella's do donated so many liturgical supplies uh you, you know saint um Philoret Mission in South Carolina that were supportive, uh, a Holy Ascension, a Holy Ascension in Rochester, all from all over the country. People sent in, you know, Gospels, Eastern Christian supply here in Etna, uh, also was very generous in, in supporting uh, the, the mission projects. Another thing that you can do to support the church, and not just in Nigeria, but in oftentimes, um, what we consider are old electronics, say your old iPhone that you don't use anymore, or an old computer, is actually way ahead of what is available in a third world country. Um, Father Stephen had been organizing all of these activities uh, without a computer of his own, without a, a, a smartphone, just a little flip phone, 
and and he was constantly having to go to an internet cafe or there were all these obstacles that we don't have and it's hard for us to imagine and yet we were able to bring with us a computer some phones uh, through the generosity of our church and and last but not least if if anyone's interested in financially supporting the infrastructure projects um, then i uh, have the paypal link um, for for bishop maximus's paypal um, again you know i never thought i would meet a real king and you grow up when you you know if you grow up listening to the prologue and there's all these lives of the saints and there's all these oftentimes kings involved and monarchs and if you go to the holy land or you go to mount athos there's all these monasteries that were built and endowed by the byzantine emperors by kings by the czars and you're like wow like you know those people had an opportunity to build these incredible churches and these incredible monasteries and be so generous and you know we don't have those resources we're not kings in reality i think everybody in america has such a higher standard of living that in some ways we do live like kings and we now have an opportunity to support the church as generously you know uh, so to finish out the 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 roofing project and to get windows in all that work you know i would probably be less than twenty thousand dollars so if you've ever felt that you you weren't able to make a really big impact there's definitely a need and it's a, a very worthy cause um i'll actually we're almost done but i'll play this well what what could you, I mean, if, if there was somebody that would be interested in finding out how he could support or what his support would mean for the church in Africa, what would you tell them? Well, every support, spiritually, physically, is welcome. It's welcome because we want to get churches, places of worship. We want people to see the beauty of orthodoxy. We want to give hope to the downtrodden. We want to restore lost happiness back to the people. There is some kind of peace that the world and money cannot give to any man. That peace comes from above, where every good gift comes from. So if anyone wants to support the church in Nigeria, they are either supporting the establishment of a temple of worship, they are either supporting the strength, that's the spirituality of it, for the people who are even charged to work in the church to work, they are either supporting or promoting, creating awareness for the church. So in every aspect they are welcome, and whatever way this support through will never be forgotten. We are going to have a list for everybody that has ever supported this church and has ever wished well for this church from all over the world here. We will pass this 100 years to come. Our successes will go through this and remember, in this year, my little child that is just two months going shall grow up and when she look in that picture where you took with me, I would tell her, this was Alex. He came to us here. They were the people that came and did all of this that you are seeing. And this was over 40 years ago. It is going to go down. We are going to make, we want to get a list of everyone that's ever donated to us. Everyone that's ever wished as well. So that we will write their names in the hearts of Nigeria. One day we shall leave, but others will succeed us. They shall leave, and others shall succeed them. Let it be written, and let it be pasted, that those who encouraged and built up this were some Americans of that century, and they were Mr. This, and Mr. This, and Mr. This, and Bishop This, and Bishop This. So we will guide us.
So that brings me to the conclusion of this presentation. I would like to again thank everyone that kept us in their prayers during our journey uh, for our safety and for strength to fulfill sort of the, the, the missionary activities that we had been called to do, or in my case, to support Bishop Maximus. Um, thank everyone for their prayers. Thank everyone that has supported um, not just the, the missionary activities of, of our church in Nigeria, but across the world, um, you know, and again, in Latin America, in Haiti, it's truly um, uh, something that is, is very God-pleasing um, to be able to uh, spread uh, the Orthodox faith in its fullness. And um, at this point, I think I'll, I'll be happy to answer any questions. I'm sure that there are some. So okay, We have a question that came in in the chat. If one okay. donates through PayPal, through B Bishop Maximus, how do we specify that it go to Nigeria? Uh, well, that's very easy. When you make a donation um, through the PayPal link um, that was posted, you can just make a note. Um, you know, there's a field uh, to make a note and just say for Nigeria, and um, then that will be earmarked for Nigeria. Or you can send a check uh, to the Holy Ascension Parish, you know, made out to uh, hold the Holy Ascension Parish in, in Bearsville. But if you make a memo, Nigeria, um, then that will be earmarked for the Nigerian efforts. When, when did this uh, mission start? What year? Uh, so this, this mission started, uh, we arrived, we left um, America July 25th, I believe, of this past year, so 2021. Um, now, Father, Father Stephen had uh, finally made contact with uh, Archbishop Kalinikos and heard back from Metropolitan Demetrius saying that, you know, his request was acknowledged and, and that we would try to send a bishop about three years ago. And at the time, Father Stephen was working in Ghana, which is, you know, close to Nigeria. And when he finally got word back um, that a bishop was coming, the next day he quit his job and moved back to, to Nigeria, moved back to Benway State and started preaching. And his, his mentality is his, you know, if I want to bring orthodoxy to the Nigerian people, I need to bring it first to my own tribe, to my own village, to my own family, because how nobody will believe me that this is the true faith. They'll say, well, how come your own family isn't orthodox? How come your own tribe isn't orthodox? So he, he, the next day after he got the response or you know, the letter from Metropolitan Demetrius, he quit his job and moved back home and, and started his work. So this work has been sort of going on for the past three years, but the church and Bishop Maximus only arrived uh, this past summer in 2021. So we were there from the end of July through the beginning of September. There was one question in the chat from Galena. Galena, you want to ask your question? Um, I was just curious, did you make your own tea garb or was that from Nigeria? No, I, I did not make my own tea garb. Uh, actually, on right before we left, um, I was presented um, the, uh, one of Father Stephen's old, actually his eldest brother, Emmanuel, is a tailor and a very talented tailor. And, and uh, I, I was presented with a full um, traditional Nigerian suit as well as a suit to bring back for uh, Timothy and Dimitri. And then they also uh, presented me with this, with this vest. So in, in honor of, of the Teve people, I, I wore it. How often are, are you uh, encounter the bishop in contact with the people in Nigeria? I mean, do they have um, regular communication? Uh, yes. So, so uh, 
I, I am in contact with Father Stephen personally, uh, I would say on a weekly basis. Oh, okay. Great. Um, you That's know, so, so, you know, maybe not every week, but uh, there's regular communication just mm -hmm. um, as well as with, with some of the other people that I personally met. And I can't speak for Bishop Maximus, um, but I do know just from from talking with Father Stephen that uh, you know he uh, and Bishop Maximus continues to support um, the the church there by being you know in addition to praying and and uh, giving sort of guidance from afar, uh, being available when when they reach out to him, um, and and God willing we we will you know. Be, I think Bishop Maximus is already planning uh, a, a return trip. Um, I can't speak as to exactly when. Uh, you know, he's very, very busy with all of his other responsibilities all around the world. Um, but I know that he truly felt that, um, you know, the, the opportunity for spreading orthodoxy uh, was very great. And it was very fruitful. This missionary journey was very, very fruitful. Um, so he he was really encouraged by just the earnestness and um, the striving for for the true faith, for the Orthodox faith, by the Tiv people. Thank you for sharing such a beautiful message. You're most welcome. Alexei, we had a couple of questions in the chat. One was from Panayoti Fotopoulos. Are there any future trips being planned? Which I think you sort of alluded to, but if you want to explain. Yes, there, there are future trips being planned. And if, if you're interested in accompanying um, Bishop Maximus on, on a trip, I would highly encourage you to reach out, of course. Um, you know, there, I'm, I'm certain that there will be a big need for more baggage carriers uh, whenever the bishop goes. So, um, you know, you don't necessarily need to be uh, an incredible apologist um, to, to, to accompany um, Bishop Maximus on, on such a trip. I think probably the most important thing is to just be humble and obedient. You know, we we had to stay in the sort of hotel complex when we weren't out on a missionary journey without a blessing. We didn't leave the the whole sort of the hotel complex um, just for reasons of security. And you know, sometimes you really wanted to go exploring, and you had to tell yourself, "Nope, where it's not blessed." So. Um, yeah, but I would reach out to Bishop Maximus and, uh, you know, if this is something that anybody's really interested in doing and and you speak with Bishop Maximus and it's blessed, then you should we would probably want to start the the visa process of getting a visa sooner than later, because, you know, it can take quite a long time. Thank you, Alexei. A few more questions as to whether women can go to Nigeria on whether it would be helpful for women to come um, and also whether they have a Facebook page or any way to send words of encouragement if they have access to the internet and are able to get in touch with people. One more question was Father Stephen's last name and his Presidera's name so that we can say commemorate them properly. Father Stephen's last name is, is Tema, Father Stephen Tema, and his presbytera is Arsini uh, or Arsenia. Um, they do have access to the internet. I uh, don't know if they have a Facebook page. Uh, it is one of the biggest ironies uh, as the communications director uh, of the seminary, uh, you would think that I'm up on social media and whatnot, and I've actually uh, try to stay as far away as possible from social media as I can. Uh, so Father Stephen does have a, a Facebook page. In fact, he was, uh, um, he used some of the resources while he was waiting for 
um, the bishop to arrive, he would oftentimes uh, use the, the material that Father James Thornton would post on his Facebook page as a liturgical resource. Um, and and I, I know that he's reached out to many other people within our church and is now Facebook friends with him. So um, perhaps, you know, Gabrielle or somebody else might be able to help direct you to his Facebook page. If there's an opportunity for women to go to Nigeria, I really can't speak to that. Um, I think that's a question better to direct directly to Bishop Maximus. Um, I'm sure that he'd be happy to, to answer that question. Um, so I would encourage you to reach out uh, to Bishop Maximus if you're interested in, in accompanying him on his next trip. Thank you so much, Alexei. I think from, from what I see in the comments, everyone really appreciated this presentation, which I expected after our first time having this presentation on St. Nicholas Day. Uh, it was very well received then, and I'm sure all the people who receive it, uh, the recording afterward will, will enjoy it just as much.